The gun crew smelled of oil and cold, and they counted on arithmetic the way other men counted prayers. Every shot, every second, every man was a fraction in a ledger that decided who went home. They were the crew of a flak 105 millimeter, a beast of steel that crouched on a concrete ring outside a city or on a windswept ridge, and the brutal maths of its survival rate was written in fragments and seconds, in the arc of a shell and the angle of a loader's shoulder. At first light, the routine looked almost banal. Shells moved like chess pieces, fuses clicked into place. The gunners scanned the sky. Yet beneath that routine was a cold calculus. The gun itself demanded exposure. Loaders had to stand to the breach to ram a shell. The trainer and layer were nearly always on the platform with their heads above the shield, and the ammunition boxes lay in neat lines where a misstep could be the last. A flak 105 mm did not exist in isolation. It was a system of men and metal whose vulnerability could be expressed in probabilities. And once aircraft arrived, those probabilities stopped being abstract. When three high-flying bombers approached, the chance of a fragment striking a man could be measured, and those measures were unforgiving. They learned to think in rates. Rate of fire, for one, was a rude enemy of survival. A well-drilled crew could maintain a rate of fire that turned the sky into tatters. One round every two seconds was an ideal that shredded bomber formations, but that cadence drew attention and returned it in steel. Each burst generated blast and spectatorship. The muzzle blast threw dust and concussive force across the platform. The crew inhaled years in seconds and each additional round increased the density of shells in the air that could fall back as lethal fragments. The math said that after a certain threshold of shells detonating per minute in a given cubic volume, the odds of one fragment hitting a man rose from unlikely to inevitable. Men felt that inevitability in their bones before they could name it. The flak shells themselves conspired against the crews. Time fuses were set to detonate at calculated altitudes, turning a 90-kilogram shell into thousands of jagged teeth distributed over a volume the size of a house. Hidden in that detail is a cold fact. The lethal radius of a burst was not a circle on a map, but a probabilistic cloud. If an aircraft swept across a zone, bursts overlapped. Where two clouds intersected, fragment density doubled and the chance of a hit did not merely add, it exploded. Crews learned to watch for that overlap because it was literal geometry of death. The loading platform and its shadow on the ground became the center of multiple invisible rings, and the maths of overlapping circles, how many bursts, how frequently, translated directly into bodies left unmoving besides spent brass. There were engineering quirks that made the calculus even worse. The 105 mm carriage was robust, but its traverse and elevation mechanisms were slow compared with aircraft speeds. To track a fast formation, the crew often had to leave the protective shield to gain a clearer view and crimp the gun's maneuverability with human reach. That reach, a hidden gem of the machine, meant that survival depended on human posture and how the gunner held his head. A single shrapnel fragment traveling at 2,000 meters per second could pass through a shield gap the size of a fist. The maths of probability reduced to posture. Standing upright during a salvo doubled the exposure area. Hunkering behind the breach cut it, but also slowed the reload. Men traded safety for efficiency. Another equation written in blood. Tactics attempted to contort the numbers. Crews staggered reloaders, rotated men every so many minutes, and kept a ration of reserve crew who could replace a casualty. Those practices did more than keep guns firing. They attempted to flatten the risk curve. But there was a brutal trade-off. The more men you placed in routine positions to maintain a steady rate of fire, the fewer you left to absorb a sudden spike in casualties. 
supply constraints compounded the problem. Ammunition shortages forced longer bursts at risky moments when commanders gambled that a short, intense barrage might break a raid. But maths punished the gamble. Less ammo overall meant fewer salvos over the course of a day, but it also meant a tendency toward concentrated bursts when attacked. And concentrated bursts produced concentrated lethal volumes. Here is one of the unexpected truths. Weather and shells conspired to change the arithmetic in ways crews could not easily see. Wind drifted, burst fragments, and a sudden thermal layer near dawn could both hide and reveal aircraft, changing the angles of engagement. A sudden mist turned fragment clouds into sticky cages, scattering lethal pieces over the ground rather than letting them disperse. Crews noticed these shifts in a tactile way, glove fingers numb from cold, breath visible in the air as they tuned fuses. And they adjusted fuses by fractions, praying that a 17-meter difference in burst altitude would lower the fragment density over their positions. A seemingly small tweak altered the probabilities markedly, and those who mastered it survived longer. The enemy played its own numbers game. Allied bomber formations used staggered altitudes and streamliner approaches to minimize the chance of being hit by a single flak battery. But concentration of aircraft over a point increased the rate at which bursts intersected above a battery, turning tactical doctrine into lethal arithmetic for the defenders. Conversely, the flak 105 mm with its high explosive shells found that concentrating fire on a narrow bearing produced a higher fragment density at the cost of leaving other sectors unprotected. Each command decision, concentrate, spread, sustain, or hold, was a calculation balancing hits on aircraft against hits on men. Midway through any sustained engagement, the hidden insight became unmistakable. Survival was not merely about skill with sights. It was a poisson of chance where the mean rate of deadly fragments landing in a cruise zone determined survival time in a way that felt biblical. The revelation, the real aha that crept through mud-crusted mouths and smoked optics, was this. Survival rates could be predicted with uncomfortable accuracy by the number of bursts per minute, the area of overlap, and the exposure profile of the crew. A battery that saw five effective bursts per minute over its platform had a median survival time that fell dramatically compared with one that averaged two bursts. Men could feel that curve bending as bursts increased. They could watch comrades replaced by silence and know with cold logic that their own odds were shrinking. The climax came in a single thunderous sortie over a city where the flak 105 mm crews were tested to their limit. Aircraft streamed in in such numbers that fragment clouds became a near constant rain. Shells detonated in a dense spray that turned metal into a glittering blizzard. The crew rotated as trained, but eventually the rotation could not keep pace with losses. The loader fell, then the trainer, and the gun labored, mis-aimed by smoke and shock. Survival suddenly was not aggregate math, but immediate. Who could still run? Who could still shoulder a shell? The gun fired on through the screaming, because to stop was to invite annihilation. Destructive energy begets more danger when silence allows the enemy to zone in. And when the smoke cleared, there were fewer men and a pile of spent brass, a ledger reconciled. When the war ended, or when a lull came and men could speak of their luck, they said something simple and terrible. The factories could build guns and shells in numbers that made sense on paper, but they could not produce men fast enough to keep the probability curves safe. That was the reckoning. The 105 mm was a superb weapon in many ways, but its mathematics of survivability, exposure, fragment density, rate of fire, and the geometries of overlapping bursts meant that human attrition was baked into its use.
Commanders could buy aircraft in the thousands or hundreds, but the human cost at each firing position remained stubborn and calculable. In the end, the legacy of those crews is written in fields and in memoirs where men still pick up brass from a concrete ring and remember the cold numbers that decided their lives. The truth they left behind is not heroic platitude, but a lesson in how technology and calculus intersect with flesh. Any weapon that scatters metal into the sky will inevitably scatter men on the ground, and the only mercy comes in understanding the odds, adjusting fuses and posture, and sometimes, quite literally, hoping that the arithmetic would tilt in your favor long enough to breathe again.